as Joe there. I'm I'm not uh, scanning for insects or finding landmines or mowing lawns with uh, inflated <laughs> tire four wheelers. That sounds pretty uh, exciting and fun. Um, so uh, let me start my presentation here. And okay. Can everyone see that now? Okay. Um, great. Well, glad to be with you. Um, Joe, thank you for the invitation. I should say Joe Nimella and, uh, and Joe. Shaw and I actually recently did a project together uh, where we where we were looking at what is how much radiation can you actually get off of a radiative emitter uh, at nighttime. So we did the, the theoretical studies of that because we wanted to see if we could increase or improve dew collection capabilities um, using just natural, naturally occurring radiative emission, the way that the earth cools. So that was a fun project that Joe and I uh, worked on together. So I want to talk a little bit about compressive sensing LIDAR. Now, probably many of you aren't familiar with compressive sensing, so I'm going to spend quite a bit of time sharing what compressive sensing is, and then we'll talk about how we're using that uh, for doing LIDAR. And just want to acknowledge uh, the AFOSR, the Air Force Sci Office of Scientific Research for, the, for supporting this work. This is primarily work that I did at the University of Rochester. Um, and these are the students on the left that worked on uh, those, those projects. So uh, this is my group that was at the University of Rochester. Uh, the people that were involved in this are Daniel Lum, Greg Howland, uh, Chris Malarkey, uh, Sam Kinnar, and uh, that's all. So now just a little bit of uh, background. I do quite a few things. I, I enjoy working on quite a few different projects ranging from atomic physics to fundamental uh, quantum mechanics to precision measurements, uh, quantum information processing, and then things like auto stereoscopic 3D, volumetric 3D, cloaking, uh, but today I want to talk a little bit about compressive sensing. We're still doing some compressive sensing, but now we're working on uh, nitrogen vacancy center magnetic field imaging. So uh, we've, we've, we've moved on to something a little bit different. So I want to talk a little bit first about what compressive sensing is, and then some of the applications uh, that we've done with it. Now, compressive sensing really got going in the in mid 2000s and this had actually been a digital signal processing had been going on for for decades but there was something called the single pixel camera that really got got things going and the the digital signal processing field got compressive sensing moving and and then i started to see I, I went to MIT and I saw a really interesting presentation by uh, at Lincoln Labs where they were they were looking at scattering through camouflage. So for example, can you see through camouflage? And they were using these single photon detectors. They were using arrays of single photon detectors. And after I saw that, I thought, well, that's interesting. I wonder. When, when I first read about compressive sensing, I thought, well, maybe we can use compressive sensing with a single pixel camera to do imaging. Now, what do I mean by single pixel camera? That doesn't quite make sense. Normally, when we think of a camera, we think of a 10 megapixel array of, of detectors, and that 10 megapixel array is basically light hitting on all those individual pixels and then forming an image. But can we do better than that? And can we use actually only a single pixel and get a high resolution image? And that's what I really wanna focus on. So I'm gonna take us back a little bit and I wanna talk about entropy first of all. So uh, 
when we define entropy, we, we say there's some random variable X with a distribution P of X. And the simplest thing you can think of is a coin. If I do a coin flip, there, the, the X is the, the outcomes, a heads or tails. And P of X is what's the probability of heads, what's the probability of tails. And if I look at H of X, that's the entropy. How much uncertainty is there in a particular coin flip? So if I take the probability, uh, if I have an unbiased coin, which means it's equally likely to be heads or equally likely to be tails, then the probability is one half um, for each one of those log two of one half. And then when you sum up both of those options, you get one bit. So when, when we look at entropy, what we're, we're, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to find the number of symbols that we might have in a, in a, in a particular random variable. For example, the English language has 26 symbols in it. And if you include a, pe uh, a period or a space, you know, you can start getting more symbols. But if I, if I look at the number of symbols and then I find out what's the probability per symbol, then I can go and find the entropy that exists um, in that distribution. So I'm going to ask you a question. We're going to make this a little interactive. And uh, I hope that's not going to be hard to do over virtual. But so how many, how many bits of information do I have in the English? How many, how many bits of uncertainty are there in the English language for a single character? What is my entropy for a character in the English language is what I'm asking. Any thoughts? Okay, so probably the easiest thing to do is you just say, I'm sure probably many of you thought, well, the probability of, of any one individual letter is going to be 1 over 26, log base 2 of 1 over 26. And you sum up all of those and you get a little bit over, you get somewhere between four and five bits. Four bits is 16 characters, 32 is uh, characters is five bits. The problem is, or it's actually less entropy than that. Now, if you want to think of entropy, the entropy is amount of uncertainty that we have in a, in, um, in a particular letter. If I'm just reading, uh, if I just have text written out and I say, what is the probability that I get an E or a T in the English language? That's much, much higher than getting a Q or a Z. Those probabilities are much lower. And so the entropy is actually much smaller than four bits because uh, much smaller than the um, four and a half bits that we initially did because of the fact that there are different letters with different entropy, different probabilities. Now, but it's actually much, much less than this. So um, I, want to, I want you to play a game here with me. This is, uh, we're gonna play Wheel of Fortune. Um, Wheel of Fortune is a game that was really popular in the United States, uh, still is. Uh, I just haven't watched it in a long time. Um, and so I'm going to give you an example. I have two words here. And I, with this letter that is circled, how much uncertainty do I have in knowing that particular letter right there? Any thoughts? This probably isn't a, a great um, a great setting to do interactive because <laughs> uh, everyone has to mute and unmute. But probably you you thought, well, whatever the uncertainty is for that particular letter. Now, if I do this, uh, sorry, let me. I'll, I'll be right back. I just need to grab a tissue.
any uh, any thoughts of what that letter might be? No. Okay. Anyone answer? H. <laughs> okay, that's a very good guess because the most common letter in the English language is the, but it's not it's not H. Okay. Anyone got it now? Oh, I got that one, <laughs> but I'm not saying. <laughs> I would hope Joe got that one. Um, so now I probably don't need to tell most of you right now what that letter is, as long as you're pretty familiar with the um, people in the audience. Uh, but for most of you, there is no uncertainty in that letter anymore. And that's a really important point because even though I don't, you don't, I'm not showing what that letter is, there is no more uncertainty for you. And that is because, because of correlation. There, there exists correlations in our symbols such that we, the amount of uncertainty is greatly reduced as opposed to um, what, what we would normally think of as, as far as, as that uncertainty goes. And so in reality, there's actually only about one bit of uncertainty in the English language. And that one bit of uncertainty in the English language uh, is, is, has been shown uh, for multiple different things. And in fact, when you compress uh, in text in English, it is about one bit per symbol. So that's, it's a very interesting thing. What actually, how much uncertainty is there in a particular character? So now, oh, I apologize. I, I wanna move on to this slide for a moment. This slide is a picture of my son many years ago. My son is now 17 years old. Uh, so this is uh, quite a bit younger. He was in our garden. This is a 512 by 512 image. Now, what I did with this image is I simply took the two-dimensional discrete cosine transform. Now, I'm not sure if you guys can see this, or if it's being blocked right now or not, but it's blocked on my computer, so hopefully it's not blocked on yours, but in the upper left-hand corner of this discrete cosine transform distribution, there should be a bright set of pixels. And that bright set of pixels basically tells us that when I take the discrete cosine transform of this image, almost all of the information is found in just a few components up to the left. Now, what do I mean by discrete cosine transform? Well, all images are composed of frequencies. Probably all of you have taken a discrete Fourier transform, but when you know, you know when you take the discrete Fourier transform of, for example, the cosine, the cosine ends up having two terms in it, uh, one that's a positive frequency and one that's a negative frequency. But when we do the discrete cosine transform, we only worry about the positive frequency amplitudes. And so that actually is a sparser representation of an image than the discrete uh, uh, cosine transform, than the, the discrete Fourier transform. So the discrete cosine transform looks at frequencies. It looks at spatial frequencies. Now, for example, look at this spatial frequency right here. I have a dark, then I have a bright, then I have a dark, then I have a bright, then I have a dark, then I have a bright, and then I have a dark. So this is this this part looks like a uh, a relatively modest high spatial frequency. But if I look along here, notice that it's almost uniform all the way up. So that would be a very low uh, frequency uh, term. So what you can see is that there's a lot of low spatial frequencies in this image. Now. This is 512 by 512, which, uh, which is a huge domain. It's about 260 something thousand uh, pixels. And if I take this cosine transform, I have the same number of pixels in that domain as well. But if I take the 81 most important elements and get rid of everything else, say everything else is zero, and then inverse uh, discrete cosine transform, I get this back. Now, interestingly, you can already see a face. 
if I take the 280 of the most important elements and do the inverse discrete cosine transform, I can see a face. And it just gets better and better to where now what I'm talking about when I say K is 13,236, that means there are K elements in this image that are important in the discrete cosine transform that are important such that if I only take those and go back to uh, this original domain, I only need about 5% of my, my pixels in order to reproduce to a pretty good degree that original element, that original image. And so that, that, that goes to show you what this means is this is K sparse. And what I mean by K sparse is that there are only a few K elements that are important that when we, when we keep those and we go back to our original domain, that's sufficient to nearly uh, reproduce that image. And so that's, that's basically the idea of compression. When we, what we're doing is we're taking, we're only using the information uh, where there's actually, we're only using the case sparse information in some sort of sparse domain where we can, where we can recreate the image. This is the, this is the idea behind which JPEG is, operates. Now JPEG 2000, for example, uses wavelet transforms, which are even better than, for example, than the discrete cosine transform in terms of sparsity. So, now, let me, I want to go back uh, here for a moment. When we, when we talk about imaging, what we usually do is we image and then we compress. But now what we're going to do is compression. So we do compression after sensing. We want to do compression while we're sensing. And so if you think about compression, what it does is it removes interpixel correlations. So just like when we talked about Joe Nimella, you knew that the J and the E in Joe were important at helping, were helping you to know that that was Joe. And those were all correlated. And we can remove interpixel correlations to get it down to the sparsest amount of information that we need in order to reproduce the fact that that name was, that his name was Joe. So the way we do this in imaging is we decompose into some decorrelated transform basis like the discrete cosine transform, Fourier transform wavelets. And we want to find a K-sparse representation of this original image. Okay, so this is how we normally do it. We compress after we sense. Now we want to compress while we sense. Why do we need all of that information if we're only going to compress it and get rid of 90% of, of the information that we took in the first place. So this is this, this single pixel camera paper really got people thinking about what, what compressive sensing does. So I want to give you a brief, brief math background, and then we'll go into the we'll go into the experiment. So suppose I have a one dimensional signal X of length N. Now this, you, we do this all the time. If you look at an oscilloscope, if you take a data set of measurements, what you're saying is you have N data points and your signal is, is what we're gonna just call X. And that's a one dimensional signal. Um, and, and then we're what we're gonna do and we're gonna have to transform that to a sparse basis S. And the way we do that is we say X is related to the sparse basis through whatever my transform is. And that is in our case, for example, the discrete cosine transform or the Fourier transform or the wavelet transform. And it basically takes us between these two domains. Now, if this is a, an N dimensional, and this is n-dimensional, and then we have to have an n by n-dimensional matrix in order to achieve that. Now, in compressive sensing, what we need is we actually need a sensing matrix. Now, I've talked about the transform matrix. We transform between one basis and another basis. But now I want to talk about the sensing matrix. The sensing matrix is a matrix that we're going to use, which when 
transformed is not sparse. So if I take, uh, if I take this sensing matrix operated on X, it's going to give me Y. But if I take psi operated on phi, I'm not going to get a sparse matrix now. I'm going to still get a dense matrix. And that just means that almost all of my elements are still there. So uh, now, if when by using compressive sensing, what we're going to do is we're going to take m random measurements from this sparse matrix, this, this sorry, from the, our measurement matrix. And we are going to uh, take these M measurements and, but the number of measurements that we need uh, is going to be greater than or equal to K log N over K, where N is the dimension of the space, K is the number of sparse elements in my transform matrix. But that is much, much less than N. So that's what I'm saying is, suppose I have a 10 megapixel camera. Well, I can do, M measurements, let's say 100,000 measurements with a single pixel camera and get the same uh, image as if I were to take 10 megapixels worth of images. So uh, at 10 megapixels or 10 mega uh, samples of my system. So this, this means M is, can be much, much less than N. <clears throat> now this is still quite theoretical. We'll, we'll get into a specific example here in just a minute. Now, what we do in order to solve this is, this is called an L1 uh, minimization. What we're going to do is we're going to minimize the number of the sum of the number of elements subject to the fact that this has to be satisfied. So we're going to minimize this sparse basis, uh, the sparse basis terms with the, uh, but subject to the fact that Y is equal uh, has to be uh, equal to this uh, result, where y is the measurements that we're going to perform. Okay, so now let's do a specific example so that it's this is a little bit easier to understand. Suppose I have an image. This is a, a relatively high resolution image. It's a famous image that we that we know in digital signal processing. Now what I'm going to do. <clears throat> is I'm going to use a digital mirror, uh, digital micro mirror device. And what this is, is it's simply an array of mirrors that are on or off. And these on or off uh, mirrors are either going to point to, towards a single pixel detector or are going to be take light and put it away from the single pixel detector. So if it's bright, it's on. If it's dark, it's off. Bright being pointing towards the detector, dark not being pointed towards the detector. And this is like our sensing, this is like one row in our sensing matrix phi. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna take that sensing matrix phi, we're going to multiply it by my signal. So this would be like, this is like my original signal X, but now we're doing everything in two dimensions now. So my X is now two dimensional. I'm gonna multiply that by one row in my sensing matrix phi, and this is what I get. Then when I sum over all of the intensity, so, so I've basically taken the product of these two things. When I sum over all of that, what I get is one matrix, I get one measurement outcome. 0 0.5022, and what do I mean by that? If this were completely on, every single one of these pixels was on, what I would get here is one. And when I do point, uh, when I put on these random, um, uh, when I put on this random matrix element, then what that does is it is half of the mirrors are on here, but Half, some of the mirrors are on when it's dark, and some of the mirrors are off when it's bright. So it could be that uh, just how it goes for this particular random pattern, I get that this is 0 0.5022 of that original uh, brightness if all of the mirrors were on. Now I'm going to do another 
row in my sensing matrix and get another measurement outcome on my single pixel detector. But now because I have a different random pattern, so I have one random pattern, then I have another random pattern, then I have another random pattern, and I have another random pattern, and I repeat that m times, or those uh, m number of measurements, which is much less than the number of pixels here, then what I can do is I can go and solve, minimize this, e uh, this equation here, and then reproduce. Now, here's, here's an example where I have M is 0 0.05N. Now you can still see that there's blockiness in here, but this is a pretty sparse, this is, this is quite a, this is only 5% of my original size of my image and it's already fairly good reproduction of, of the original image. When I start getting to about 0.2 or 0.25, it starts to look very good uh, as an image. And that's much less than, per, than taking n measurements. Now, um, why do we want to do this? Joe, I think, gave a great example of a place where, where this can be useful. One of the things Joe talked about in his talk was scanning his laser. And when you scan a laser, what you're doing in this LIDAR is you're saying at this particular point, I want to get the, I want to get the feedback from this LIDAR signal at this particular point, then I'm going to move the LIDAR, get a uh, feedback from that signal, move the LIDAR, get the feedback from that signal. But now what we can do with this is we can flood illuminate a set, uh, uh, an entire area and get the signal back from all of those positions and then measure it with, with only a few measurements instead of doing say, you know, 100,000 scans. I think you did 1,024 by 1,024. Joe, I can't remember. So that would be a million, a million scans. We, we just do a flood illumination with a megapixel DMD and maybe say do 100,000 different DMD uh, configurations. And so instead of doing a million measurements with a scanning, we don't have to do any scanning. We can flood illuminate. And all we have to do is change our, our digital micro mirror device. And the nice thing about it is we still get about the same amount of flux back uh, with, with every scan because we're uh, we're getting the same, essentially the same return signal. Okay, now, so this, this is a, a resource efficient. If you're using a single pixel detector, it can be very, very useful. Now I did a lot uh, to this point in my career, I had done a lot of single photon, high dimensional entanglement characterization. And we were able to use this, we were able to use this technology to dramatically reduce uh, the, the work that we did. In fact, I had one student who was able to take a characterization of a high dimensional entanglement, took about a day, but had he done the same dimensionality with his, uh, with his system, scanning a single pixel detector through correlations, it would have taken him years and uh, years to do the same project. So it can be, it can be very efficient. Um, so these are some of the things that I thought were that have, have been that were done recently that I thought were were pretty neat. And there's been a lot more uh, since then. And um, some of the things that we've done now, I, I want to focus on lidar. So how can you use this for lidar? Well, the very first thing that we did, and this is probably I I don't actually have any images from this one, but it, it's it's fairly straightforward. What we did is we just sent out a beam of light. It's basically look at this, this system right here. This is essentially what we did is we took a pulse, we illuminated a scene. Then uh, we, we just had a single photon uh, counter. So we were interested in just looking at single photons coming back. And that's really useful because single photons, you don't have to worry about uh, quantization noise, you can, you can measure right at the uh, shot noise limit. So, and so you can do with very low light levels of 
of sampling. And in fact, we were able to show that we could get real time, uh, real time feedback from a system with only picowatts of light, which is um, which is pretty neat. So uh, we we weren't doing it as nearly as fast as Joe though. Joe is doing some really high frequency stuff, which is is really neat. But in this particular one, what we did is we just had multiple arg targets at, at multiple depths, and then we just received histograms at all the different times. And then we said, well, at this time distribution, let's reconstruct, let's reconstruct what we get. And then we saw all of the objects at various distances. So we had, for example, uh, camouflage, and then we showed something behind the camouflage and we could image the stuff behind the camouflage because it had a, a different uh, time signature. And so it, it was, uh, it was a, a pretty neat thing. But uh, the one I really wanna talk about today is, is um, another one that we did, which I thought was really neat. And when my graduate student came to me with this idea initially, I thought he was, he was all messed up. Uh, but then I realized it was one of the coolest ideas I'd ever heard. Uh, what he did is he said, let's, let's go back to here. He flood illuminated a scene. Then he took light coming back from, uh, coming back from here. And he said, so let me back up a little bit. There had been lots of people that wanted to start using compressive sensing for doing LIDAR, but they were talking about really hard uh, ways of doing doing it, non-linearities, uh, things that just made it really hard. And when when my my, my graduate student came in with this, I we realized everything could be done linearly, and it was very simple. All all he did was here's here's the scene. You can't get any depths. Then what he did is he said, "All right, now let's simply just illuminate that scene with these these single pixels." With these, these, uh, this single pixel camera, we can do all the measurements, get back light. We can take the total, total sum of the intensity and reconstruct with the total intensity. And then this is what he got. But now, then what he did is he said, all right, for a given time window, let's suppose I have the, 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 uh, the DMD is, on and it's it's at one setting and during that one setting we may measure a hundred photons and so what he does is he says okay so there's a hundred photons at, in that one setting and and then in, he does another he does another image and he does a it does another random pattern another random pattern another random pattern and he can reconstruct and that's how he got the intensity but he said all right so let's suppose we got a hundred photons but then let's also say Let's simply add, well, photon one had a time of arrival of 9.6 seconds. Photon two had a time of arrival of 9.8 seconds. Photon three had 9.9. Well, photon three had 8.4. Photon seven had 8.6. Photon uh, 12 had, uh, you know, 14. And so basically he said, well, let's just simply take the sum of all of those time of flight, and then take the sum and reconstruct the image based on the sum. And when you're doing that, that's an intensity multiplied by the time of flight. So if you take the intensity multiplied by the time of flight and divide by the intensity, you get the time of flight. And so, the it ended up being a very simple linear problem where you could reproduce all of the objects at at the given distances uh, just using this this single pixel uh, technique and then uh, just to show how useful this was we basically put a 3d pendulum in flight and then just tracked that as a function of time and we were able to do it at, I think, about 25 frames per second. And But can, remember that the, the digital micromirror device is actually flashing much, much faster than that. If you want to get a high, if you want to get high resolution images of a, 
of a scan of a system, you have to have a DMD that's flashing very, very fast. In fact, when I presented this at Xerox a few years back, they wanted to use it for um, to recognize how many people were in a car so they could they could make sure that they weren't overcharging on toll roads. And they were going to operate their DMD at 100,000 frames a second so that they could get, uh, say, a, a thousand uh, or, or get high resolution, very high resolution images um, uh, in, at a, at, in real time uh, frame rates. So um, now this one, I think, was also a really fun one to work on. How am I doing for time? I, I don't, I can't. Let's see yeah, you got doing, okay. 20 minutes Sorry? or so. 10 About minutes? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay. I think. So now what I did in the last one, as I said, well, let's, let's pulse, let's pulse light. But do we need to pulse light? Can we just do frequency modulated CW LIDAR? And frequency modulated CW LIDAR is much cheaper because you can just use, uh, well, in often cases it is much cheaper. It can get high, very high resolution depth. <clears throat> and essentially the idea is you're just sweeping the frequency of a laser. And uh, when, when you sweep the frequency of the laser, then when you get a feedback signal, then you can say, you can heterodyne beat the, <coughs> the two frequencies, the incoming frequency and the uh, uh, frequency that you keep. And what that allows you to do is by getting the beat note, you can know what is the uh, distance that an object is, uh, that something is scattering from in the distance. But what if you're flood illuminating a scene and you have 50 objects or a thousand uh, objects that are uh, sending return signals? Well, then what you get is you get a distribution of frequencies and you can, you, what you're going to see is a bunch of oscillations. You take the Fourier transform and you see all the different frequencies, which give you all the different depths. <coughs> then you change your random pattern, you take your DMD and you scan and you get one set of frequencies. You take your another random pattern, you get another set of frequencies, you take another random pattern, you get another sense of, set of frequencies. Now this is harder than just getting a single number. Now you're getting a Fourier transform distribution with each measurement, but then you can go back and reconstruct the full Fourier transform and recon then reconstruct your full depth map of your <coughs> entire distribution and see where everything is uh, with in flood illumination. And so here's the basic idea. You have some original frequency, then you have, for example, two uh, incoming frequencies. You beat these off of each other and you get um, some sort of uh, differential signal uh, that you can that you can measure. And here's the original scene. This is this was all done in simulation. We didn't actually do the experiment. <coughs> and then here's the depth map that we uh, of what the what what it originally looks like. This is the scene. This is the depth map. And then these are reconstructed Im images at 5% sample rate and at 25% uh, sample rate. So we could under sample and still get uh, good reconstructions of where the objects were. So we, we've done actually a lot of things with this compressive sensing, measuring entanglement uh, correlations, um, showing we showed that we could get high resolution images and the Fourier transforms. So it, maybe we didn't think was possible. This is basically like saying we had a double slit and we get the double slit interference, which is, you know, a lot of people don't think you can do that. Um, and then um, we, we showed that we could do uh, entanglement imaging. Uh, we showed that we could do wavefront sensing. We showed that we could actually, uh, this one's kind of, uh, uh, this one is actually really, really cool. 
this, this basically shows that we can take an object that's not in focus and mathematically project it to the point where it would be in focus uh, by knowing the, the momentum and position of every uh, photon. And, and anyway, we use this, we use compressive sensing for doing this. So uh, we, we, we did a lot of uh, really fun stuff with compressive sensing. We think there's a lot more left to do. As I was saying, we're, we're, we're now working with uh, someone at the Hebrew University and we're doing nitrogen vacancy centers and looking at the, um, with the nitrogen vacancy centers, we want to be able to reconstruct rapidly what the magnetic field is that's, that is, uh, that the magnet, that, that the NV centers are, are sensing. So, and then be able to reproduce high resolution magnetic field uh, distributions. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm open for questions. All right, thanks a lot, John. That was great. So, Abdul, over yeah, to you. Uh, so, uh, I have sent text as well. So, uh, anyone who want to ask question, just to please raise your hand uh, so you can ask directly from the speaker. Okay, uh, Joe, I think we can wait for a few seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we uh, John, could you maybe uh, stop sharing your screen and we'll uh, yeah, and we'll see our that makes it easier to see everybody. All right, looking for you sure. Okay, yeah, we have one question from Malik So. Okay, uh, you can unmute and ask your question, please. Malik Saul. Hello, everybody. Hello. Yes, yes, yes we yeah, hear you. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. It is a good uh, presentation, but uh, I uh, have one question. Sure. Then I would like to know who to know if the if your method. Uh, can be used to, to image throughout partially obscuring objects such as camouflage netting. Yes, and that's what that that was the 2011 uh, paper. Yes, we imaged through camouflage. So we we basically showed that what we would do is we would send light through camouflage, and then on the other side of the camouflage. What, what we did is we would get a time histogram and then we would bin the time histogram and then do uh, then do lidar at uh, at we would then do the reconstruction of the image at a given depth. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, so, any other question from participant? Uh, we still have two minutes. You yep. can raise your hand and ask directly. There's one. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Dixon, you can, yeah. It's uh, Dixon Liani, Liniani, if I am pronouncing his name right, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for the good talk. My question is, uh, I noticed you are using uh, a digital micromira device uh, yes. in implementing this compressive sensing yes my question is how easy is it to incorporate this device in any other existing optical device for example if i want to use it in a, a spectrometer is it possible yes in fact that that's a really excellent question um in fact they i have some friends at rice who use that it as a hyperspectral camera. So what they what they did is they simply took the light going into the fiber. What you can think about is now the fiber into a, a spectrometer is now uh, is 
uh, now your single pixel. And then they reconstructed the image at every wavelength. And then they were able to reconstruct the, they were able to do it, make a very simple hyperspectral camera. Now this is, uh, I wanna really point out, uh, this is Dixon, right? Yes, um, yes. This is really simple to do because these are everywhere. These digital micro mirror devices are everywhere. They're in projectors. Um, probably the very projector that you're, um, you use when you watch a presentation or something like that. You can, you can buy these for a hundred dollars. And because they're essentially projectors, you can operate these simply with your HDMI cable out of your computer. And then whatever is on your screen is now what's going to be projected onto your digital micro mirror device. And so you can, for, you know, if you have a, a Raspberry Pi, something very simple, you can actually run a, uh, an experiment using this device very, very cheaply. For, for three or $400, you can actually have your own uh, DMD uh, system that, that operates very, very inexpensively. Um, so it, it's, I, I think it's a really interesting and, and powerful technology. Of course, you can buy $20,000 DMDs that have all kinds of uh, amazing capabilities, but just to get started to do something, it, it's, it's a very straightforward thing, to, straightforward thing to do. You can shine a laser directly on a DMD, you and you just have your computer telling what your DMD uh, should would should show on your um, pixels, on your mirrors. Okay. So, any other question from participant? Please raise your hand. Yeah, we have another question from Nina. Uh, Nina, you can now unmute and ask, please. Okay, um, thank you for the informative talk. I'm Nina from the Philippines. Um, I just want to ask on the last part of your presentation wherein you have mentioned a non-focused image and then you obtain a focus one from the correlation of the momentum and the position of the photons. And I'm just wondering on um, how did you get the momentum and position of the photons in the experiment? Well, that is a great question. Um, let me... Um... Let me just pull this uh, slide back up. If Can I just share for just a moment here? Yes, yes, you can do that. Um, okay, oh, I hope I wrote that down. Oh, goodness. I didn't write the... Uh, uh, I'm really sorry. I thought I had the, the paper on there. Um, I can, I, I can get you the, I can get you the link, but basically, are you familiar with the full field? Are you familiar with the idea of measuring the full field? In when, when you measure the full field distribution, what you're doing is you're getting both the momentum and the position of a photon. And, and, and let me, back up just a moment. If, if I have an image that is, if I have an object and then I put it through a lens and then I have an image, then the object is going to be imaged over here. But what if I actually have my imaging device moved up? Well, we know that if I moved my imaging device here, it would come into full focus. But Imagine now that what I do is I move my device, but instead of measuring just, instead of just measuring the position of all the rays or the momentum of all the rays, I get both the position and the momentum of, the, of every ray. Now, why is that important? Well, if, if I know a ray strikes a point here at this particular angle, then I know just because of the fact that we assume that light rays travel in a straight line, that over here, it's going to be at this point. And so um, by knowing its position and its direction for every ray and its color, 
then I can know where this is over here. And so what we did with compressive sensing is we got the position information of all the photons. Then we got the momentum information of all the photons. I know that sounds crazy, but because you're doing compressive sensing, you're not getting all of the information about all the photons at once. You're doing it in a set of uh, measurements. Then I can reproduce where the object is and be able to focus mathematically the, the image because I get all of the information about that object at any particular point. Uh, um, I, hope that, I hope that made sense, but. Uh, yeah. Thank you so okay. much. Welcome. Okay, any other question? Oh, I think Joe, we don't have uh, okay. any well, question. Or... Okay, well, uh, thanks again very much, uh, John, for that really wonderful talk. Um, you know, it's kind of, it always impresses me about, uh, I mean, hearing you and, and also Joe, uh, speaking, uh, some of the things that statistical uh, analysis, just the various types of analysis, actually apply across a wide variety of fields. And so uh, I can see, uh, just like in low temperature work that we do, most of it's plumbing, and but what we also have to do uh, a lot of statistical analysis that really doesn't depend on what the what the actual uh, units were. So it's it's actually the the idea that you have a skill set uh for these things is pretty important i think for for all students uh at any rate that 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 came through um so i i want to make a couple of announcements uh tomorrow we're going to do a photo a group photo so you know anybody wants to be in the photo you know comb your hair i'm going to go get a haircut uh i had to get one <laughs> anyway but uh, no, just kidding. Uh, no, actually, I'm not kidding. Um, but, uh, but anyway, we'll have, a, we'll have a photo. But the other thing we're going to have are, are a series of uh, talks by some of you. Uh, some of you uh, submitted research abstracts. And so uh, we have uh, an hour starting at six. And, uh, and so that's going to be kind of exciting because these are, uh, these are five minute talks. And you think, well, five minutes, what can I say? Well, you can actually say quite a bit in five minutes. Uh, usually we do three minutes, <laughs> so we're giving you a lot of extra time. Now you can say a lot, but you can't say too much and you can't get bogged down in details. So the, it's kind of a fun exercise. We do it at the colleges. We've been doing it for years. And the idea is just to uh, try to encapsulate your, your ideas and, and really distill uh, what you have to say and get the message across clear. And, and I, I sent some of you an email. So the best way to think about this is, you know, you're really making a pitch uh, and you like your research, you want to get some funding and you just happen to run into Bill Gates and he's going to give you five minutes, but he's not going to give you another minute after that. So you really got to make the case. And that's the idea. And I think it's a really, uh, it's a real fun experience. Nothing, no pressure, uh, just have fun. But, uh, but we will have a few prizes from SPIE, uh, OSA, oh, sorry, Optica. I got I to gotta put another dollar in the jar every time I, <laughs> I call Optica OSA. Uh, and, uh, and John, what do you think about ICO? We can, we, can, we can sponsor a prize, right? Sure. Okay, there. That's from the president. By the way, I just call him Mr. President. Uh, some of you call him <laughs> Professor Howell. It's a, okay. Um, all right, so we'll have a few prizes too. But anyway, it's, it's kind of fun and, and it's nice to hear what people are doing from around the world. Um, so anyway, that'll be tomorrow, but we'll have the group photo as well. Okay, so that's that, uh, and tomorrow's the last day. Uh, so it's at uh, any rate, thanks, John, again for, for giving us a talk, and uh, that, it was really great. Uh, this is this is fun. It's the first online uh, activity I've ever <laughs> been associated with, <laughs> so I didn't know, but it actually works out uh, works out pretty well. Uh, Okay, so at any rate, uh, I think that's it. We'll see everybody tomorrow. Um, thankfully, my uh, computer didn't uh, didn't uh, drop out. Uh, well, maybe.